Okay, let's get started again. This is lecture number three, but it's a, uh, well, I don't know, the numbering sequence is sort of off, but this is using Unix. And um, so what I covered, uh, well, I covered yesterday was the history and the kind of introduction to Unix operating system. What I covered this morning, um, well, actually, we covered some, a few commands as well yesterday. And uh, what I covered this morning was uh, the kernel, user mode, uh, for those of you who missed it as well as uh, basic uh, fundamental concepts of what the services are that the kernel is responsible for. So this lecture takes it another step further and goes into the concept of using Linux and Unix in terms of the goal, um, in terms of understanding the role of the operating system, understanding uh, the differences between the command line, the GUI, and understanding basic Unix commands. So there's a lot of Unix commands in this lecture. Uh, this also goes through the change mod and a lot of the navigational stuff. Uh, so we'll talk about the history of the, you know, the terminal prompt uh, information. So in terms of, uh, we already know what the operating system is. We talked about that already. So it is software, and it controls the relationship between the applications and the hardware. It controls the relationship among different applications as well. And uh, most of us who uh, grew up with the DOS command know about command line prompts or command line interfaces. Everybody really prefers GUIs these days, however. Uh, but the command line prompt still comes in handy. So I want to talk a little bit about the interfaces to Unix today. And using letters and symbols such as, you know, C colon backslash and instructions that are typed in. So there's a high rate of errors. There's typos and stuff like that. Uh, GUI systems obviously are the preferred method these days, double clicking on icons and stuff like that, um, including pictures, descriptive words. Uh, it always makes it kind of easier. So it's much easier to move the pointer with the mouse and the picture than it is to, to type stuff into a screen. So what does an operating system do in terms of controlling uh, the services that it's providing? And this lecture is really, the last lecture was on the kernel mode. This lecture is really on the user mode in terms of Unix. And um, controlling the input, the output, the processing, the activities for the computer. So high quality operating systems can make your computer more effective and efficient. As we've seen before, customizing and building your own kernel can make your system a little bit more efficient because we can include specialized design, drivers and interfaces to the hardware for your specific computer versus um, generic, you know, generic drivers and generic stuff that won't necessarily take advantage to what your, of what your hardware has to offer. So a good operating system makes the computer easier to use. It also makes it faster. It makes it um, reliable, safe, secure. Uh, which is you know, all features when you're trying to basically measure or judge the quality of an operating system. So with the role of the interface, it's a traffic cop, it's a communication system, it's a box of tools, it's a self-starter. So as a traffic cop, we're looking at controlling the resources of the computer, including memory, file storage, CPU utilization. In terms of multitasking, it's the ability for more than one application to run at once. So it's possible on uh, new computers to have more than one application run simultaneously if we're looking at a GUI or looking at a command line interface. And just because we don't have a GUI, we can still use the command line interface to run multiple programs. We just run them in the foreground and run them in the background so we can run things simultaneously. Unix is also a communication system, networking system, as we've seen before. Helps all the hardware components communicate with each other, helps uh, communicate with hardware itself. Also a toolbox, several different utilities that are included uh, in terms of file management, memory management, networking tools. This is all the stuff I covered this morning in terms of kernel services. As a self-starter, the operating system also just takes over after booting, and so it's what's running constantly on the computer hardware, so it checks for hardware, makes sure it's present, and there's no errors in it. You have the concept of the hard boot and the soft boot for turning off the computer, turning it back on, restarting, restarting things again. So. We covered the history, so I'm not going to really go into very much in terms of um, Unix, which you know developed by Bell Labs in 1969. Uh, the command line operating system, however, is kind of an interesting concept. It was never meant to actually support a GUI, which is kind of interesting. Um, but even most breeds of uh, Unix themselves have GUI front ends as well these days, like Sun OS and stuff, Sun Windows. But the uh, command line prompt and the purpose of this lecture is to kind of review the basic navigational system of the command line interface. For, for Unix. So issues uh, commands from a command prompt. This is what the prompt looks like. You can change your prompt, have it say something else like your username. Unix is case sensitive and commands are typed in lowercase. So CP to copy is not the same as capital C lower P or capital CP. So we have to make sure that we also use a, we're case sensitive. All Unix commands by default are in lowercase. 
So that's why people, when they, they write specialized programs, they like to put it in uppercase or something. So I don't know. I usually put things in lowercase. We talked about the shell yesterday, and I showed you different types of shells. We looked at shells for corn, corn. We didn't look at corn. We looked at bash. We looked at seashell. Um, I believe I also loaded up a couple, couple of shells, and I showed you how to switch between the shells. Uh, but picking out the shell and then uh, picking out the scripting language or picking out the interface is kind of key to the configuration of your system. And uh, outside of that, you just have to be familiar with the command line interface in terms of the syntax of all commands that looks the same. All commands are pretty much run the same. So we are case sensitive, and all of them run lowercase. And the format, the general format is the command name, the switches, and then the arguments. So CP to copy, and we have the, you know, the source file to the destination file. To move, you know, the source file to the definite de destination location. Um, every single Unix command follows the same format. So it's kind of easy in terms of the processing of commands. Knowing the switches, and I showed you uh, yesterday the manual pages. Um, and so you can look at the manual pages and come up with all of the switches. Here's an example of the ls command with the switches, is what I'm call calling it a switch. We have minus l and then star.html for the arguments. So if we follow in through this command kind of sequence. We'll be running the ls command to list out the directory contents and then using this particular switch. And we can string the switches. So it can be like minus l, h, you know, w, something or other. So it makes it uh, all of the different options that you're going to apply towards the command. Um, which is kind of like, you know, the grassroots kind of command line interface as what we've seen so far. We can correct typos and errors. We can use the delete key to remove characters to the left or use in terms of the for Telnet clients, backspace will also work. So a lot of the times when you're logging into a Unix server, you're telnetting and you're getting a command line interface, and you're not going to you're not going to bring up a GUI, which you know you're going to you're going to be typing in commands, and so to erase something, to backspace, to move it, to um, toggle through different histories of commands that you've typed in is it's important to make your life as a system administrator um, more efficient. Here to erase, you can actually type in a capital CW, which erases the previous word, or CU to erase the entire line. So, and a lot of these actually are consistent with, um, you know, not the same, but are consistent interfaces with VI as the editor or with um, simple scripting and stuff like that. In terms of the directory structure, we looked at this yesterday as well. The unit paths we talked about actually the directory format and the file structure this morning. Um, in terms of the Unix paths, beginning with forward slash. So the initial forward slash here representing the root directory. Typically, only the system administrator has the full privileges on the root directory. Users don't normally have uh, privileges to that. Talked about the absolute path as well, beginning at the root. So it's absolutely back to the beginning of home, user, whatever happens to be back here, home, vhacker, public HTML. Or the relative, which would be images. And we use a dot dot to go relative instead of absolute. And uh, this is the purpose, as I went through yesterday, all of the assignments for the course. The purpose is essentially to uh, be able to become proficient to a certain point in terms of the navigation. A little bit more on directories. The command pwd, as I, this is also a review from yesterday, to show you uh, returns the directory name in which you're currently working or the current path for which you're located. The directory that represents your personal section of the server is called your home directory. So terminology and this stuff is still this stuff is still um, relevant in terms of um, directory structures in terms of the notation this might look familiar we well, everybody knows this one this is the root it represents a, a directory if nothing here it's going to be empty it's going to be root otherwise we're separating out directory locations with this symbol this symbol the, the forward slash and the dot represents the current directory the two dots represents the parent directory so it goes back to the parent in terms of navigation, this goes into the current directory. And then the home directory is using the tilde sign. So it represents the user's home directory in terms of the syntax. So in terms of creating a directory, don't use spaces and directory names, which is kind of interesting because then Windows people, they start ranking Unix directories and they go, my space documents or program space files. And then you realize that's an extended namespace. Um, that's not supported. But then you figure out, well, it's a namespace, so you just load on the namespace support, and all of a sudden you have Windows namespace support for long directory names and long file names. However, it won't be supported on all Unix systems because there's problems with the inodes, as we've seen earlier. 
these names get resolved to paths, and if the names have spaces in them, it's not, you know, just the namespace and the, the look and feel of the interface we're concerned with. It's storing the representation of that path. And if the inodes can't handle the spaces, well, then it doesn't really matter if you have namespace supported or not. You're going to corrupt your file system. Um, using the underscore here, or a camel casing is uh, to, for directory names, which means a camel casing is like, you know, when you don't capitalize the first, when you capitalize the first word of the new, first character of the new word, so if it was my documents, and we wanted to do this in uh, Unix, it would be lowercase m, y, no space, but a capital D, and then the rest of the word documents, which is uh, an example of what they call camel casing. And it makes it easier to read the name, and eliminates the spaces. Um, so directory names are case sensitive as well, usually in lowercase with camel casing for the directories. Here's an example of camel casing right here. Camping images with a capital I. So this is the name of the directory. And this is making. So to make a directory, you use the MK directory. And uh, this particular lecture will come in handy when you're doing one of the assignments, actually. Because uh, you'll have to make a directory, copy this, copy that, copy recursively, uh, list out the contents. And what you'll have to do is, you know, simply supply the command that you would run uh, to perform that particular operation. So here's the file and directory permissions. So if we go ls minus l command, we'll show the full details, including the file name, the owner name, modification date, the size, and also the permission sequence that's associated with it. Here's for Unix permissions. Unix permission sequences are found at the beginning of the directory listing. So we had the first 10 characters. In this particular case, we looked at this yesterday, but we're going to kind of get into setting them today. Um, so D is going to be the directory. And then we have the owner's permission, which is the read, write, and the execute. And uh, the groups, which is also the read, write, execute. And then the world, public, read, write, and execute. And so when we're not setting it, when we're setting it, we, we, we actually see it. And if we type out, uh, if, we type actually, if we type it out, let's go new window, uh, ls minus l, if you see it over here, we see this. Let me go to the top here because there's a header line actually where it's going to show us the is it a directory? This is a directory. It's under staff, desktop, staff, documents, downloads. Um, and then in each side of in each side, inside of each one, it's going to show us all of the three for the read writing for the group, for the public, or for the individual or the owner um, permissions which is what this is referring to, it's that last column. And you get that by going minus L for the entire listing. So. Sticky what? Uh, what is it referring to? Mm, sticky bit, dirty bit. The on and off for whether or not the file has changed before it has been written back out to the file system it would be the sticky bit. So it's, it's kind of like the concept of me main memory and the dirty bit. It's the sticky bit where if, okay, so this is not a file. You missed this morning's lecture. Uh, through the inode system, we mark whether something has actually been changed and whether it's been written out before you mount or unmount a disk, before you start doing manipulation on something. It's not quite synced uh, in real time. Instead, things are saved up and they're processed in batches. And one of the things that gets updated is whether or not something has changed in memory and has not been written to the disk yet, or whether or not um, it needs to be written. Maybe it doesn't need to be written if it hasn't been changed. Whether the file is open, whether the file is closed. Because if we don't keep track of this information, we have, we have corruption, essentially, in terms of the directory structure when we unmount something or when we disconnect something. So we have um, bits that are set. And then that, that's actually in. We have plus and minus, and we have um, uh, whether or not it's showing in here. Here we go. You know, the at symbol, the plus symbol, and stuff, which is basically showing uh, state and uh, access. Whether you can actually, there's a different switch on the ls command. I don't know it off the top of my head. You could look up the man pages. That'll show you whether the file is open, if it's a file, or whether the directory, um, you know, if the, if the directory is empty, if the directory is full. Uh, and there's different ways of kind of navigating through the system to sort of see the state. And it would be referring, what you're talking about is like referring to the state of the particular file that's being accessed, or directory, or device, actually. 
We can tell if a device is in use by its file descriptor. And as uh, I mentioned earlier today, everything is represented in the form of a file. Even directories and devices and interfaces are all files. So we run normal file permissions and file commands on everything, and it's all treated the same in terms of the abstraction. So the first character here representing the directory of the D, and if it's a directory, the D will appear. Um, and then the first character, otherwise, you'll normally see a dash to say that there is no directory, it's a file. So, um, and here, the R obviously stands for read, the W stands for write, and X stands for execute in terms of the interface. So the remaining nine characters are divided out into three triplets. So we've got the three sections here, or three, six, nine total in terms of the, the bits that are set. So the second, uh, the first one is the owners, the second one is the group, the third one is the world or the public permissions. So in terms of the first bit, the first position is the R, which stands for read. It grants permissions to uh, view the contents of the file or directory. The value is going to be an R or a dash. So the second one is going to be the write, which stands for the W. Um, or the W stands for write. Grants permission to modify the file or the contents. So you get the W or the dash. And then the execute, or the X, in which, um, you know, whether or not it can actually be opened or whether it can actually be run by the user. So the value is going to be X or a dash. So in terms of the Unix permissions, when changing the permissions, and you'll have an, you'll have an assignment where you can uh, use the change mod command with um, a bunch of switches, essentially, that are going to have you um, select different modes to set different files in. So when you're doing this, you have to decide, well, what number will represent the permissions? So you can do this by determining whether or not the permission is on or off. So if something is on or off, it gives it a 0 or a 1. So if you turn it on, the permission uh, will get a 1. If it's turned off, it will get a 0. So after deciding which one of the three permissions uh, in the triplet that's going to be on or off, um, you have a binary number that comes out of it. So you can convert the binary number to an octate, octal equivalent. And this is where we get, you know, set the permissions 777, which is pretty much the highest you can go um, in terms of access for, for the user, for the group, and for the public. Um, and in each one of those numbers comes out to a 0, a 1, or 2, or 3, or 4, or 5, 6, 7. So 640... Six, is uh, pretty restricted for public. Um, it only needs a read write. Excuse me, it's just read access. Um, if we go zero 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 here, if, we, if permissions are all turned off, we have a zero. So anytime you see a zero on a file permission, you know it's going to be restricted to some point. Um, just putting on execution here, uh, the binary representation of it turns into the octal number. So going through the 7 here, the 7 in, on the other extreme. So 0 is that everything turned off, 7 is everything turned on in terms of uh, the privileges. So if you set everything with the change mod command, you can go change mod space, you know, the name of the file, 777, and give the world and the user and the group, everybody rewrite, execute privileges. So once you've established the number representing uh, the tri triplet that you're interested in changing it to, you use the change mod command to give the directory a you know, file. And here, here it is here, change mod 777 space, or 755, which is pretty normal, because you don't want them to modify files. You just want them to be able to execute. You want them to be able to open files in the public interface. So the syntax is the change mod, and then the permissions mask, and then the file or the directory. Here. So you can change the um, permissions on files. You can change them on directories. It makes no sense to make everything, you know, in terms of the files, 755 or 750, when the directory is 640 or something, and which means you can't access to the directory. So who cares if all the files are accessible inside of the directory? So a lot of the trick is taking it from a directory to a file context. So and even if the directory is uh, made to be open, made to be readable and executable, the files inside may not be, and not all of them might actually be public. So each file itself can have its own permissions set for it. So typically directories and executable files are given 755 permissions while others are given 744. So, so in terms of navigating the Unix system to move through directory to directory we use the cd command it's the same as the dos change directory. So cd space the name of the path. And here we have to, to move from a child to a parent we can go cd space dot dot. So going back to the single dots, the double dots, to go back to, through the navigation. So that makes a lot of sense. You go cd dot dot, and you go back from 
the subdirectory that you're in back up to the to the previous directory that you're in. To move from a grandchild to a parent directory, we can type in cd space dot dot forward dot dot. So we can go back through without actually having the name, you know, to type in the name of the directory, moving to the parent directory from a grandchild, which means we're just going back two steps instead of one, essentially. And then they move from one child to a sibling directory, which is kind of interesting. You're over here and you want to be over here. Well, you can go dot dot, which is taking you back up to the parent. And then you're typing in child two, which is the name of the other directory that you want to go to from the parent. So you're really just going like this. You're going back up to the parent and then coming back down to child number two. So the ls command uh, shows you the contents of the directory, so you can add switches to the list uh, to get um, you know customized kind of view. To use more than one switch, you can concatenate them, and you can concatenate them by putting them together. So ls minus lt, so you can go ls minus l, lt. I think h is in there there too for human readable, and it'll tell you a little bit more information as well in terms of uh, what's going on. So you just string out the you string them out and concatenate them together. So you could have a big long list if you wanted to put on all the options that are available. And here's some more examples of the LS. So minus L shows you the files in the long format, including the permissions that we just looked at a few minutes ago when we were looking at the file permissions. Uh, minus A shows the hidden files that might be on the system. And minus C, actually let me go back here. Minus C is going to give us the column formats. And T is going to sort by the last modified dates. Um, so, if we had any hidden files, actually it might be interesting to see, minus a, ls, minus a. Um, it's going to show us the dot dots and the dots. So, we actually do have a bash profile, that's nice to know, um, which is going to be nice for the next, I don't have to install, I don't have to create a profile. So, next time we'll be looking at some of these hidden files that are scripts that are going to be used for uh, profile settings, for user accounts and stuff. But this is all hidden. We don't normally see any of this stuff here um, in terms of what's going on uh, with a normal LS. Uh, using the wildcards with LS as well as possible, so LS uh, A uh, asterisk to give us all files starting with A, or star, dot, star A star all files with A in them, in the middle of them, uh, which is you know kind of interesting to find as well. You don't know. You're going to get a lot of files with A, actually, because A is a common word character. Or LSA, you know, ending or having HTML also in the name, uh, ending with HTML. Or the um, question marks, which are the wildcards that say, well, give me all five character file names, because I have one, two, three, four, five. I don't care what the character is, but five characters along. Then we have, as an example here, the names, file names starting out with A, B, and C. A, B, and C. And uh, this lecture, or actually these examples, are going to help you because this is what one of the assignments is having you do. Say, List all the file names starting with A, B, or C. And here's your answer. You can use the brackets to go A, B, or C, asterisk. So you can starting this, following with anything. Or LS A through C. Same as the above, but done as a range instead of going A, B, C. Because you can go A through Z, that would be everything. So it's a shortcut method. Or files that are not starting with A, B, or C. <coughs> the caret symbol sig signifying the opposite or the not scenario. So the Unix copy command, another helpful one. CP can be used to make a copy from uh, one file, leaving the original file untouched. So the original file is still in place. You usually make a copy to move when you don't want to move, but you want to keep the original. You can make a copy for a temporary copy. So the command would start out with CP old file name, and then the new path of the new file name. So make a copy of a file uh, with, with, while both the original and the copy are in the same directory. You could go index.html, home.html. Without specifying the directory, it would use the same directory. <coughs> and to make a copy uh, that results in a copy retaining the original's name, you don't actually have to give the name. So here, what we're going to do is house in a different directory, index.html. So we've got the dot dot. Move it up to the parent, put it in an academic directory instead. And here's another example where the file result is having a new name and it's housed in a different directory. So <coughs> instead of just going dot dot academic, 
we would go dot dot uh, home dot html instead of calling it index dot html. And the move command is actually very similar to the copy command, except for it's not keeping the original. It's actually moving it to the new location. So mv is the command for that. Two purposes, move the file from one directory to another and then rename the file at the same time. So mv old file space new file path new file name, which is very similar to the copy command. And here's an example of that. To move the file from one directory to another, keeping the original name, we would mv index.html backup to the parent directory, go to friends, put it in friends directory. And then here's a rename to a file, it stays the same, same directory, but we're going to rename it. So we're actually moving it. We're moving index.html to home.html in the same directory. So it's sort of like a copy, actually. Copy and a move. Slightly different purpose, though, for the move. So that, you know, I would just do a, just done a copy, actually, instead of a move, but they both do the same thing. So to move a file and then rename it at the same time, we could go index.html space friends home.html. Well, that sort of looks like the copy. In fact, it's the same uh, command that we saw earlier with the cp command, but this is the mv. So deleting files is pretty simple. It's just rm for remove. So to remove, we go rm space file name. Kind of dangerous, especially when you go uh, use the recursive command that we saw yesterday. So we got rm minus r, everything, you know, <laughs> remove everything. So you can pretty much delete everything all in one shot. Kind of dangerous. Uh, deleting the file here to delete a single file, rm index.html. And then answer yes or no if you have confirm turned on. A lot of people will turn off confirm though. So if you have this feature called confirm turned on, it's your last saving grace just because there's no undelete. So not like Windows where we could just go to the trash can and pull it back out. Unix, it's pretty lost. But there are some third-party tools that you can install to actually create an undelete feature. So you can undelete your files, just like you do in Windows. So to uh, delete multiple files using a wildcard, you go rm space asterisk html. And then if you have confirmed turned on, it's going to ask you if you want to delete it or not. <clears throat> so in terms of deleting directories, use the rm remove directory to delete the directories. And the directory must be empty unless you're using the minus r to recursively delete everything inside of the directory. Uh, but the directory must be empty, otherwise you're going to get an error message with this particular rm dir. So to delete a directory uh, of images, it would be uh, rm dir images, and then answer yes or no to the confirmation. Other useful commands, the password, uh, to change the password, allows you to update your uh, user password, exit, to exit out of the system, not bad. You can also type in by, B-Y-E, to exit. Actually, I wonder if by is actually supported. I believe exit is supported, or it should be supported. By, no, by not supported, <laughs> but exit is, so, <laughs> interesting. Uh, clear, clears off the terminal screen for you. Uh, or CLS, actually, if I believe ours is clear on, ter on the terminal prompt. Oops, because I closed the window, I have to open up a new one. Yep, clear works. I don't think CLS, no, it doesn't work. So. <clears throat> it depends on uh, the terminal that you're using as to which command is going to actually be functional. So that's what I was saying yesterday. When you start running through some of the assignments, it's going to say type in clear or CLS. Well, it might not work. So you might have to actually find which command for which uh, shell interpreter that you're actually working with. Uh, who's going to list out who's currently logged in? Finger, username, retrieves the information about a user. I believe Finger works on, on the Mac, but let's just see real quick here. Yep, it does. So it tells me who I am. My shell is bash, my directory my login name, how long I've been logged in. I don't have any mail, and I don't have a plan. <laughs> but uh, We can actually customize the finger information to figure out what finger information you're going to want to actually see. We saw this yesterday, and it works on the MacBook, the uh, Cal, C-A-L, for the display a calendar or date to display the current date on the system. We've got the bang bang, which actually pronounced bang bang, repeats the last command. So if we type in 
two exclamation points, if I can find that on my keyboard, actually. Here it is. Oops, wrong window. Oops, there we go, bang, bang. Missed the finger command I ran last. So, kind of made, I mean, it makes your life a little bit easier sometimes, instead of having to repeat commands again. I'm kind of lazy, I'll use up in the down arrows, and that will allow me to just like, scroll through a whole list of my commands that's in the history. Or you can do the bang and then A through Z to repeat the last commands beginning with the selected characters A through Z. So depending upon what the command is, if it was bang B for, no, it would be bang F for finger. So we could, um, actually I won't do that, but we can figure out which um, command that we want out of the history instead of going through each one of them individually. We saw this yesterday actually with the men pages, the more command. So this is the pipe, and we're piping more. So we're adding the command. We'll also display. It will display to uh, keep it so it doesn't scroll off the screen. Um, so you can press the space bar to continue the execution of the output, and you can see it all. Um, to force the page stops, we can go ls minus lt and then go to more, force the stops, or to temporarily stop a process, you can go uh, control z or cz. Actually, if we're going to type it in. Uh, suspended process that's running. Some more useful commands. Uh, FG for foreground process brings a process to the foreground after it's been stopped. A vacation. Turn off the auto reply for email. Pine. I don't believe Pine is actually installed and Emacs is not installed as an editor. Actually it might be. Let's see. Emacs. It is installed. Very good. Control C out of that, or you could simply close the window. <laughs> uh, Pine, though, I tried yesterday, it's not installed. It's a text line uh, email program. And in fact, uh, the interesting thing is you can install anything you want. You just have to basically go to the, the right site and uh, app get it or install it from a package uh, installation program. Um, so the online manuals we've seen before it has the eight sections. We looked at this yesterday, so I'm going to kind of skip through it right now. And using the man with the man space, the name of the command will actually bring it up. So if I typed in man space cp, it brings up the cp command or man space ls. And as we saw yesterday, there's also the HTML interface to it. So you just go to Google and type in man pages, and you'll see the uh, HTML version of the manual pages. So I know that was kind of quick, but this kind of looked at a little, lot of review because we actually went through most of that yesterday. And that was lecture number three. And um, I skipped 2B, but I just want to bring it up to show you uh, what the 2B was about. It was all basic Unix commands as well. And um, this one is about 23 slides, and it goes through um, easy stuff, you know, getting to the shell, returning from the shell, interacting with the system, the VI, the, the use of the word the cat you know, to output or redirect the output of a program, copying programs, removing files, editing files, and it was kind of a, you know, a list of commands, it was kind of a repeat of um, the last lecture, and um, it's meant essentially for extra reading if uh, you're brand new to the command line interface, it will help you uh, in terms of your navigational skills a bit. So, you can optionally go, I'm not going to go through 2B, but you can optionally go through it on your own. Um, the other one, lecture number four, as an example, is on the VI editor. So what we're doing here is, uh, you know, giving you some, you know, five slides going through essentially command tools, command options. So um, think of it more like a tutorial on how to navigate through VI. And most people will remember certain things like how to get into it, how to get out of it, how to save files, um, and then everything else you would uh, essentially just have to look up while you were doing it. You're not going to memorize commands. But the interesting thing about the difference between a command line interface and um, the graphical user interface is that uh, the graphical user interface, the user no longer has to remember anything. It's all visual. So you don't have to actually memorize commands or think about something. And it's kind of interesting how many commands one could actually memorize if given an, enough time. So the more time you use DOS, the more times you use a terminal prompt, you don't really think about it. You just go to the directory and you just start typing in the commands. Uh, because your short-term memory is going to remember it. Okay, um, this is lecture number five, and um, 
what I'm going to do is kind of minimize what you have to listen to today by going through and just showing you uh, what's in these lectures in terms of more additional information. And um, in lecture number five, I'm really not going to go through this one either. It's like 45 slides, of, and there's a lot of overlap as well. But in this lecture, if you missed this this morning, the inode information is in here um, in terms of, and then again, going through the read, write, the execute, and the change mod. But the lecture also brings up the change owner and the change group, uh, which is a supplement. I showed you a few minutes ago change mod, which is going to change the file permissions and directory permissions. But what if you want to change the owner of the file or the group of the file, which group the file belongs to? So you can also um, set an unmask value. Uh, so permissions given, you know, so the file itself by the process of the unmask value will change the default, change the mask. Uh, so there's three types of permissions, and we saw these already. And there's three types, three sets, and we saw those already as well. And access to the checks. Uh, made against the process is effective IDs, which is basically a way of tracking the file by an ID that's associated with it. And uh, we've actually gone through this as well, so I'm going to kind of skip through a little bit more here. Uh, but this is nice, you know, to list out all the commands as well. We uh, the line return, the hard link, or the excuse me, the, the uh, symbolic, the hard link to create a hard link to a file to create a symbolic link to a file that has special commands in here as well to print a file if you have a printer routed to an LPT port. We went through the Unix processes this morning as well, so this is sort of a, I'm going to kind of skip through this, but uh, the concept of the process ID is kind of important as well, because if you can track the process ID, which is what we're given for each one of the running programs, then we can kill processes and send processes to the background or send them to the foreground and really manage the operating environment. And then the process relationship, um, we are not going to have to program with threads in this course. I've saved it for the Unix, excuse me, for the general operating systems course. But in this particular class, we did con we, do, we do consider the concept of processes in terms of threads and the interface. And the exe to, exe -C to execute, which actually is a kernel level system call from this morning, um, that runs to run a program. In fact, the system call exec actually is what executes those processes for this. And then wait, essentially, to suspend a parent while a child runs as well. And then the exit, to terminate the process gracefully. And then here we have an example of a program that creates a new process to copy a file. And you're wondering, well, why in the world would we want to do this? We just use the CP command. And actually, essentially, this is what the CP command is actually doing. Um, so we're running the CP command inside of an exe EXCCL, which is just a variation of the EXCC. And uh, what we're doing here is just creating a process to run a system file. So in a true implementation, we could actually write the source code, let's say, for CP. And then we could take CP and we could uh, you know, change it, re replace it with our version of CP. That puts up a little you know, status message that says, hey, we're all done. It gives us more confirmation or something. So when we fork an operation, every, every process coming from this morning that runs on a computer, every program that runs on the uh, kernel runs in the form of a process. So we have a process operation that is actually referred to as a fork um, in the Unix operating system. So after the fork operation, the memory that's being used by the process is now shared between the parent and the child. And uh, going back to the process abstraction and the memory usage that I talked about this morning, um, we can really facilitate, it, it's actually automatic. I mean, as soon as we create a child process from a parent, it's already in the space. So it's really, you know, it's a no-brainer in terms of the implementation, and it makes for an effective operating environment. So here's after the XCC of, of let's say, program number two, um, we're still sharing the same process space. So the parent process data and the child process data is going to essentially be holding program number two text data from the child process data. And um, I went through the boot sequence before lunch, actually. In the Unix process, genealogy, uh, whatever, the family tree <laughs> is going to go through in terms of the init process one, which forks off the init process, which starts the user mode. And then we have init EXCCs that are going to set different um, features. And these are all done in scripts. And so during the second meeting, next time we meet, um, we're going to be going through these startup scripts. And when we do that, you'll see 
how the whole system gets automated and configured. Because um, we can all, you know, we have another set and another layer of the family tree that goes through and sets utilities, telnets, sessions, logins, and then we finally get to the shell. So there's a, a few layers of abstraction underneath the shell, which is that terminal prompt window that we're using. In fact, if we were loading a GUI, uh, like Grome or something, we or KDE, we would load it from the shell, so that would actually end up on the bottom. Uh, so, in terms of process permissions, the same way we do with files, we can actually set uh, permissions. So the real ID and one or more real IDs are set at login, and then effective user IDs and group IDs are set. So if we have if we run a process, we have control over our process, and other users aren't kind of see our process because it's owned by us. So the kernel pretty much keeps track of everybody who owns files, everybody who owns processes, who's got what open, um, and all these kernel level data structures are kept to manage the multi-processing system with the multi-user in mind. So there's a lot more overhead in terms of user supports and connectivity than there is in other operating systems. Um, I talked about signals this morning, the message that the process can send to a process, or a process group if it has appropriate permissions associated with it, if they're allowed to send signals. And it's a form of inter-process communication. So each process is a receiving process, can ignore the signal, can uh, specify an action that must happen on the receipt of a particular signal, or have a default behavior that's possibly uh, taking place, usually a process to kill or something. In terms of the signals, we have, as an example here, when a child exits or you know stops running, it sends a sig child signal to the parent to say, hey, I'm done, basically sends um, the signal, and then the parent can clean up the mess and take down the, you know, remove the child memory information. When the parent issues a wait, it tells the system that it wants to catch the sig signal so, so it can handle it, essentially. And we have signal handlers that we put into place as well. Um, and the signal handlers um, are essentially just controlling what happens when the signals are generated. And it makes for a nice, I won't call it exception handling, signal handling. So it's, it makes for a nice, interactive, automated kind of process behavior that occurs. And um, to summarize the stuff that I had talked about actually yesterday as well, the pipes. And uh, I mentioned that pipes were a form of inter-process communication. Um, so are signals, actually. Um, and so Unix has uh, kernel-level thread control to handle inter-process communication and inter-process communication libraries with locks and weights and all sorts of different checks and message. It actually has direct um, direct communication and then message passing that occurs. So, which is something that another operating system like Windows would not actually have. Um, but the kernel actually in Unix systems support multi-threaded applications because that's how you're going to get a lot of activity happening on one computer. You've got tons of threads, tons of processes are going on, different users that are happening, and um, it really does need the support for inter-process communication built in at the kernel level. So if you're ever doing any systems programming and you ever have to work with threads, you know, you're not, not going to be able to do it on a Windows system. You have to use a Unix system because you need the support for it. We talked about pipes, and that's a pipe of one process sending information to another process. When we pipe information from an LS command and we send it to another program, what we're doing is we're sending output from one program in as input into another program. And so un, in terms of unrelated processes, you know, we have the first in, first out name, you know, for pipes, system B, message queues, uh, semaphores, shared memory, all facilitate inter-process communication. Um, also, we have the underlying socket abstraction as well in Unix. Sockets are nothing more than creating a mode for sending through ports uh, from one computer to another and formulating. Actually, it's using threads. So you take a, create a thread, bind it to a, you know, to a, socket that's bound to a port and then you have two ports that are connected and you send messages back and forth uh, which is the form of communication actually in Unix. In terms of the process environment that includes the IDs, the open files, the current working directory, everything that's associated with the process, signals, everything. Um, in terms of file descriptors, I talked about this earlier actually today, and in terms of a process that's associated and a file descriptor is a pointer or a number actually, it's an ID. And so we have file descriptors that we create for devices, 
Uh, so we have a, a mouse as an example, would have a descriptor, and when we wanted to use the mouse, we would read information from it, write information to it, and use it sort of as an abstraction of the physical device. Open files also get descriptors associated with them. It's a pointer to the file, loads it in memory, so we don't have to keep going back and forth to the hard drive um, or wherever the file is open. We looked at this yesterday, and uh, we looked at standard input, output, and error, and I gave it numbers, and I said, wow, we got number 0, 1, and 2. Well, the numbers are actually the file IDs. It's, it's a file descriptor that's associated with it. So we can just open up, and we have it automatically when the kernel boots up and the initialization happens and before we get it even to the shell we have these file descriptors automatically set for us and the interesting thing is people like to use instead of the numbers because it's really hard to remember that zero is input and one is output uh, instead they'll use the abbreviation like the signal signal labels uh, which are all in capital letters uh, and we'll see that um, actually we saw that yesterday in terms of what they're called Here's some uh, process uh, sub-tools, sub subsystem utilities. PS we looked at yesterday. Kill we looked at yesterday. Monitors. Uh, PS gives us the running current state of all the processes that are running. Um, kill, you know, terminates a process that's running. Wait to hold one, you know, to wait. Uh, no hub makes a command immune to the hang-up or to the termination terminal signal. So you can't be terminated. So it's, it's going to stay around forever. Sleep, nice, nice makes the run process in that run process in the lower priority. So we know it's a huge backup job. So I'll run. I want you to put the word nice next to it, so it doesn't eat up all the resources of the computer. It runs at a lower priority. So if the CPU has another process that has a higher priority, because everything's going to have a higher priority, it's going to run that. And when it's not doing anything at all, it'll run the nice process in the background or in the foreground, depending upon where you have it loaded. A set user ID, set group ID mechanisms. It's uh, basically for changing uh, the group ID or changing the, you know, the user ID for a process, for a directory, for a user itself. And uh, it creates a nice, effective environment. So changing your own password is an example. Security problems. Are there security problems with Unix? Oh, of course there are. Well, not really, especially if we set permissions. So permissions on executable files, on directories, so any directory in which it is uh, contained must be correct, otherwise it's easy to replace Trojan horses for directories and put virus files anywhere you want. Um, so some systems remove the set IDs and the set grid bits uh, whenever files are modified as a security precaution. So Or remove the utility that actually sets stuff. That way you don't, can't make something visible, you can't unhide something, you can't change your permission or something on a file. So the next part of this lecture sort of shifts gears a little bit and gets into the differences of the, some of the different shells that we looked at. And I kind of want to cover this as an overview uh, just to finish up what I gave you yesterday in terms, and we actually, I went through and actually ran several of the shells and they don't look any different. It's the commands that are going to be different and as I was saying before, a lot of the sh modern shells are all the same. They're all supporting pretty much the same set of tools. And the concept of the shell is that it's the command line interpreter, the programming language between the operating system and the user. And it's the shell is that terminal window where we're typing in those commands. Um, in the next interactive session, we'll look at shell scripts um, and writing them in Perl and uh, also using C shell. And so they're just executing commands at the Unix shell. So working within the shell, uh, the shell invokes automatically during the login. We're going to end up with a shell whether we load a GUI or not. And uh, basically, or you can manually enter up like I've been doing here, going into a terminal and creating terminal windows. It uh, reads a special startup file for initialization. It's usually the bash file um, profile. Uh, it's going to set you know, the environment variables I talked about yesterday. Displays prompts and waits for user input. Executes user commands. Uh, just sits there, kind of like in a state machine looking for stuff. Yesterday, we looked at the redirectional operators that happen in shells, so this is a little bit of a review of that, so I can kind of go through it kind of quickly as well. Um, the single or the double to append versus uh, just to write it out. So here we'd say uh, man ls. So send the man page for ls to info.ls, essentially. And that way we can open it up and read it in a text editor if we want. Redirecting the output of cat uh, piping. So we have a 
cat file type it to word counts so we're going to count the words that are in the file as we put it out on the screen so it counts the number of lines excuse me because we used to minus l and wc stands for word count so some shell core features they range from simple to complex commands the redirection of the input the output the pipes the wild cards background processes foreground processes built-in commands programming constructs all supported in terms of the simple command supported, simple command might be a sequence of non-blanks uh, arguments separated by blanks and tabs and things. Those are the commands that we've been seeing so far. So those are all what I would call simple commands. Where the first argument is numbered zero, and the second one is uh, going to be sequentially in terms of a you know a string, a character string or a, uh, array actually is implemented, which is interesting because a lot of people don't think about it when. We're but when you learn to see in command line arguments, they're shell arguments. And it's just pulling it out 0, 1, 2, and an array of words that you put by, separated by spaces that you had in the shell when you ran the command, um, which is where that's coming from, actually. Uh, it's going back to the concept Unix is C. C is Unix. So it's following the same process. In terms of complex commands, we have multiple commands that we can run together, and then command groups, and then conditional command statements. So the file name expansion in terms of the wildcards. So we see, have seen this already. Uh, the asterisk and the question mark to give us matches any single question, any single character or match a string. We have the list that matches any character in a list. Uppercase matches any character in the range of up lower or upper inclusive. Meaning don't look for just upper or lower, just look for everything, upper or lower. In terms of the shell scripts, we would normally, as I mentioned, actually kind of went through this process of sort of like creating a batch file in the old DOS days. You put a bunch of commands, you save it in a text file, you make the file, you use the change mod plus x to it, and you make the file executable. So you can uh, run the file. Very useful for automating repetitive tasks, administrative tools, storing commands for later execution, stuff like that. When we write the shell script, we saw this yesterday as well, we put the hash sign or the number sign at the beginning. Of, this, of the text file uh, and so that the uh, interpreter knows that it's a C shell or knows that it's a Perl shell or script. We also put the path name there for the executable as well. Path name is used by the interpreter uh, you know, of the script. So if we put here uh, Python or Perl, we would know that that was going to use a Perl interpreter, a Python interpreter. Um, so if neither one of them applies, all that information is uh, missing. This is kind of um, misleading. It may not necessarily be interpreted by the born shell. It depends what your default shell. On a MacBook, it's actually the bash shell, shell that's the default. So one of the assignments actually has you create what's called a here document. So I thought it might not be a bad idea to, before you leave and start working on those assignments between now and the end of the course to know what a here document's all about. So. Here documents. The shell provides alternative ways for supplying standard input to commands. So it allows an inline input directional using these directional operators. The same way as we saw the output, here's the input called the, here we're going to call three documents, so called here documents. Excuse me. This is the redirection of taking the command line input and putting it into the document is the here document. So what you're going to do in the when I, yesterday when I went over the assignments for the course, there's one in which you're going to create this spam mail message. It's going to say, hello, Mary, hello, John, hello, Susan, hello, Fred, and it's going to have a text body. So what you're doing is essentially making it so when you type this name of the script, you're going to follow it with a whole string. It's going to be my spam space Mary, Joe, Bob, Smith. And it's going to take all that stuff and put it in and say, Hi, Bob. Hi, Joe. Hi, Smith. And then email it out. But you don't actually have to have it email it out. Because why would you want to send spam to your friends? So, unless you had to, oh, you also need, would need, require the email addresses to be sent in as well. But that's the concept of the here document, where you're taking the command line arguments and you're delimiting them out and then using them in the text of the script. So, if I wanted to say, you know, create a, a generic backup program, I could say my backup space and then give it all the directories I wanted to back up. And it would take that directory and automatically back up each one of them, or something like that. Talked about shell variables last time, actually, uh, yesterday, and that they have several mechanisms for creating variables, including the variable. So a variable is a named named piece of information representing a string value. 
You can also have number variables as well. So it allows you to store and manipulate information just like you do in programming, actually. We made some uh, local and environmental variables yesterday. The local ones go away when the shell goes away. The environment ones stay. So we can print out the environment or look at the environment variables and see that most of them start out with um, the dollar symbol. And if we use the dollar symbol, we actually get the value of the variable. Or we can see what variable is there and print out the variable. And so local are set by users or by the shell itself. So we have positional parameters or variables that are normally set only by the command line. Uh, here's some example of uh, some environment variables. And we've seen most of these yesterday, actually. Home, you know, the user's home directory, absolute path. The path, excuse me, the list of directories to search for, the path of mail, the user. So if you had mail ex as an example for your mailbox, you can just, you know, use this in a script. And every user, every mailbox that was set in their environment variables for their absolute path to their mailbox would be set correctly. So instead of hard setting a mailbox number, you just say mail or home. And whatever user is using it is going to change for the environment variable that's saved for them. In terms of the positional parameters, when, so when the shell procedure is invoked, <coughs> it's going to look at uh, and creates positional parameters. So the name of them just go sequentially from 0, 1, 2, 3. And there is, you know, if I said my spam space, Bob, Mary, Joe, that would be Bob would be 0, Mary would be 1, Joe would be 2. And that's what's meant by positional parameters. So in terms of command line arguments and ways of using things. Most shell scripts also support the concept of quoting. Quoting restores the literal meaning of the characters that are processed, especially for a shell. So literal meanings are not passed onto the command. So single quote, inhibited wildcard replacement, or variable substitution. Double quotes inhibit the wildcard replacement only. So when the quotes are nested, only the outer quotes have any effect. The inner quotes actually don't have an effect when they're nested. We have built-in commands, and this is where the shells actually become a little bit different. Some of the built-in commands are a little different, as we've seen so far. Commands that are internal to the shell, and so if you're using another shell, you're not going to get the same commands. Faster to execute sometimes, more efficient. You can actually write your own commands, and put them in there, put them in the environment variable, and create your own shell, actually. In fact, a lot of people do that. Shells uh, does not have to fork to execute a command. So the trade-off is a redirectional input-output not allowed for most of these built-in commands uh, because they don't, they're, not, they're external to the Unix environment. They're kind of add-ons. Here are some built-in commands. We saw a couple of these yesterday, actually. Echo, put something to the screen, change the directory, wait, exit, eval, you know, execute, shift. Um, so these are common to all three of the common shells that we're looking at. In terms of, and this is the end of the part one of the shells, and in terms of subshells, uh, so when a, a parent shell forks off, and we did this yesterday actually, forks off a child shell, the subshell is actually running inside of the other shell. So what I did yesterday was I, you know, kind of just typed in sh, sh, cs, batch, you know, just all these different shell names, and when I did that, I was actually executing them. I was starting new shells. So we have hierarchical nesting of all of these shells and uh, what happens is a group of commands is executed and we can actually we can execute and we can go back to so a shell script is executed by using you know the dollar sign to, to execute the shell script the background job is executed by the ampersand and we can kind of manage multiple shells simultaneously if we wanted to uh, for getting some work done so we can open up a shell start a background process let that run open up another shell do something else with it and then flip between the different shells. And we've pretty much created a multi-processing system, essentially, with multiple shells. So a, shell's, uh, a shell inherits parent environment, but does not uh, get the parent's local variables. But it will get the parent's environment, which is also kind of helpful. So that was kind of a brief run through of lecture number five, which is on the shell concept and kind of some miscellaneous concepts uh, that we've looked at so far. In uh, lecture number six is what you're going to need, and I'm going to sort of end on 6A for this time, because this will take us through all of the material that we're going to need for you to do all first four assignments, I believe, and uh, maybe the, not, not the projects, the projects you're going to need to wait with, but uh, you should be able to do at least the first four. 
And this is 6A, and this is going to have the commands that you're going to be using, the grep, the WC, the uh, translate is probably also in here as well. Um, so it's not a bad uh, lecture to use uh, for the command syntax and for the functionality. So the objective of this particular lecture is to use uh, the pipe operator in redirecting and outputting. Uh, and there's some examples in here you can actually try on your, uh, as soon as you install your Unix box or your Linux box on your Linux partition or your you make that ISO, you download the ISO image and you make that live disk and boot the system to the disk. So pipe operation is the redirection of the output from one program to another. Grep is to search through specific patterns in files. Unique is uh, to remove duplicate lines from a file and make it all unique. Com and diff compares and contrasts two different files. So we can see if one has changed or if one has not changed. And then the WC command for the word counts. That gives you line counts as well as word counts. And also, yes, it's a, it does go through the TR command. So said, you'll have a program, you'll have an assignment that uses all of this stuff, actually. To manipulate and transformate commands, which include S, translate, PR, and seed, seed excuse me, can't talk today, it designs a new file for designing new file processing applications, creating, testing, running shell scripts, and stuff like that, which is the purpose of this uh, mini lecture number 6A. So advancing your file processing skills. Selecting commands to focus on extracting information from files. So these are the commands that you're going to use in uh, one of the assignments where you're going to give me the command that you use to do something. And the, something is going to say, find all of the words in this file that start with B or something. Or take this file and reverse the contents of it. And you're working with text files. So when you're working with these Unix commands that are going to uh, grep to look for something or translate something. So manipulating and transforming commands, they alter, uh, they alter and transform the extracted information uh, in different formats. Awk invokes awk processing for pattern scanning. Uh, cat concatenating files, change mod, join, paste, and um, having me read you the uh, descriptions of each one is not going to help. You actually have to like do the assignment. I believe it's number three or four. Um, actually, all of them, all the assignments have uh, commands that you have to type in to process stuff. Uh, but using the pipe operator, this little line here, we actually looked at this yesterday, and that redirects the output from one or more. So as an example, we pipe to more. So we send the ls command to the more command, and we make it so that more basically gives us page breaks. So we do, the information doesn't scroll off the screen so we can't see it is a good example. So you type in ls space and then the pipe signal and then more which says take this and send it to more. And more is going to show it nicely on the screen for us. So the pipe operator can connect several commands on the same command line and here's an example here where we did ls and I can try to make this a little bigger so you can see it. ls forward slash etc. pipe it to sort minus r then pipe it to more. And if we do that uh, we see, you know, ls in the etc. directory. This is the information. And then we have more on the bottom. So we can see that that's working. So, so here's using a pipe operator connecting the commands useful for viewing directory information. When you're using grep command, we would search through a uh, search for a specific pattern in a file, such as a word or a phrase that, a phrase that might exist. The options are, and the wildcard support allow powerful searching, as you're going to see in one of the assignments. So you can increase the script's usefulness by combining it with other commands, such as head or tail, actually. And um, I'm not going to show you too many examples of grep in these things, because this is what your assignment's going to be about. Uh, unique removes the duplicates from a file, as we've seen. Uh, compares only consecutive lines, therefore unique requires uh, it to be sorted inputs. Uh, so we can go from one line to the other line, make sure each one of the lines is unique. And the option allows you to generate output that contains a copy of each one of the lines uh, that has a duplicate. So we know what's been duplicated. Here's an example of running unique on parts and sending it to inventory. And anyway, if we do a more inventory, we can actually kind of see the contents of that. So it's going to go through and using unique to remove the duplicate entries. Uh, why we would need that? Well, what if we have a bunch of lists of information that's coming from another source and we want to find the unique values in it? Uh, 
it might be, you know, how many times did a particular user log in, or how many times did a particular user get an error message or something. You know, if we had a log file, we could use unique to go through and see how many users are in there, how many unique users actually had a problem, or did all the problems come from one user. So here's a kind of a continuation of the example here, using a few more command line switches, and uh, basically creating a file containing the output without the duplicates. So then we have the com command used to identify duplicate lines in sorted files to compare. So unlike the unique, it doesn't remove anything. It works with two files rather than one, and it compares one file to the other. So it compares the lines common with file one and file two and produces a three-column output. So we've got column one, column two, and then what's different, or excuse me, what's, what's the same between the two. And then diff, which is, actually does the opposite, attempts to determine the minimal changes needed to convert file one to file two. And this is where we can tell, as an example, going back to that automated script that you would write to do a backup. If the file hasn't changed, then why would you need to back it up? So you can have a whole list of backup files and do a diff on the current files, and if there's no difference, if nothing's changed, then leave it alone, don't back it up. So it kind of minimizes um, the amount of backup, or how many files you actually have to store. So the, the codes of the output indicate that in order for the files to match, specific lines must be added or deleted. And what you're getting are the specific lines that need to be added or deleted to the one file or to the other file to make them the same. But it's simple just to see if it comes out with anything. No output would say there's, there's no difference. The files are identical. Uh, the WC command sounds for word count. It used to count the number of lines, the words, the bytes, and the characters inside of a file. So you may specify all three operations in one instance of the command and get the words, the numbers, the lines, everything out of that file. So if you don't specify any options, you'll see uh, the count of the lines, the words, and the characters, all of them in that order. And here's an example here. If we do a word count on a print cap, we have 8, 52, and 289, respectively, for the number of lines, words, and characters that appear in that file. So we can run the command line switches and only get the one that we want for a second or third option. This is the one that is going to cause you the most um, headaches in terms of that assignment is the translate transforming commands. So the commands are said TR and PR used to edit and transform the appearance of the data before you're displaying or printing it. So said is the Unix command is an editor that allows you to make a global change to large files, which is nice for automated files. Minimum requirements are that the input file and the command that said let's said no what actions to apply to the file. So like take the file and put it all from lowercase to uppercase or take out all the cases or do something to manipulate it. So they have two general forms of the command, editing commands and then scripting file. So editing on the command line or a script containing a said command itself. So TR for translate copies data from standard inputs to the standard output substituting or deleting characters specified by the options or the patterns. So it could translate uh, A's and turn them all into F's or something um, in terms of the, uh, the pattern. So the patterns are strings and the strings are a set of characters. So you populate a popular TR is converting lower characters to upper characters. Changing case is popular for TR. PR prints specific files to the standard output. I don't believe you'll have to print anything, but you'll have to, well, you don't have to physically print it, but... Uh, Knowing how to use the print command is not bad, because as long as you've got something directed or port forwarding from the LP port, um, it'll go to a printer, and it's a nice way of you know printing out the results of your backup or something, or some automated report that you've put into a script. And there's some defaults that are set 66 lines, and you know you can change the defaults essentially by changing the variables <coughs> or the environment variables. Uh, design a new file processing application. So the next part of this slide set actually goes through what would I do if I wanted to create a script. And I'm kind of kind of breeze through it because I don't really like this section, but if we were creating something, we could, you know, design records using a structure or using an array of information. We could link files with keys, perhaps. We can put together little reports or layouts, and then we can create a program. And then when we create the program, we're essentially writing a script using a text editor to create a menu, go through the process flow, um, create
create the project in terms of what it is we're trying to accomplish. And this is what system administrators do, actually. They find a way to solve a problem using a script, and then they automate it so that it runs like a program. And uh, so it's not like a traditional style programming. It's more of a script uh, administry. It's actually, instead of programming, it's, it's administration, really. And uh, you can format the output in awk is the command uh, used to prepare a formatted output. Um, so for purposes of developing a file application, if we were doing this, it could print out a little menu for us as an example. So it provides shortcuts for Unix commands as well. So we can use a script uh, to implement this application if we were going to put it together. And, and it would contain the commands to execute. It contains comments and things of that nature. And then we would run the script to run the program. And then it would go out and do the system backup, or it would go out and do whatever it is we had in the script. So, so in summary of this particular lecture, and we are getting close to the end here, uh, what we have here is uh, this lecture covered the uh, processing commands, uh, file processing commands, um, unique removing duplicates from lines, comparing two files, looking at the difference between the two files, the tr command, the sed command, the pr command. So. Uh, this particular lecture is number 6A, and it's going to help you with one of the assignments. Actually, it's not going to give you all of the command line switches. What you're going to need to do is go to the man page, type in man space tr, and then find out what all the switches are, and then those are the answers to the questions. There's the combination that you're going to have to put together to solve the question. The question is going to say, how do you do this? And then you have to come up with a command to do that. So, and whether you do it or not, I don't really care. I mean, it's not a matter of demonstrating to me that you ran a command. It's figuring out what would the command be if I were to create this. So. Okay, so we have 6B. That was 6A. 6B, I believe, is on shell scripting. And this is what we're going to do next time. So what I've hit in this particular section was, and this is sort of the concluding of, concluding remarks of the first interactive session. What I hit was uh, an introduction and an overview and the entire, and that's all I'm going to give you on the command line interface. You can't learn how to navigate a Unix box by listening to someone read off dozens and dozens of commands. It's not going to work. Uh, but what I gave you is sort of a broad overview or foundation of where to get the information using the man pages or using the internet. Also, what are some common things that are done in the environment in terms of listing out files and using the terminal window and the concept of the shell and stuff like that. So um, we're actually about halfway through the course, which is not all of the information. Uh, there's a lot of lectures I didn't go through. So when you go into the bhacker.com website, what you're going to want to do is take a look at all of some of the stuff that I uh, kind of brushed over, uh, which is you know, 2B, I don't think I went over that one, and you know, some of the other six, I haven't gone over the sixes yet, but that's the shell scripting that's coming up. So as a goal, you could probably do the first six assignments before the next class meeting. And the next class meeting for this class is going to be on March 10th and 11th. And uh, the final exam is going to be on April 14th and the 15th. So. Those people who are listening to the video who did not show up in person will have to show up next time. And when you show up next time, you're going to get a full tutorial on scripting. So the entire one day is going to be on Perl and creating shell scripts. And we're going to write a couple shell scripts and you'll see how it works. Um, and then you're looking at Unix ut ut uh, utilities, which is going to be the second day that weekend. And then the last weekend is going to be on the final exam. So there's a lot of out-of-class work that you'll have to do. And the out-of-class work is what I went over yesterday. And you probably could do all six assignments. It's all on Unix commands. The projects are a little bit more entailed. The first one's going to be on Perl, actually. Uh, one of them's going to be a here doc. Uh, the other one is going to be, uh, I can't remember, I went through them yesterday. But this way I would kind of save and these, knock out these before next time and then you'll be able to do those just fine. And um, sometime between now and the end, I'm going to, oh, look at the CSLO is out here. OK. There's that CSLO essay that's uh, worth about 10% uh, or something. It's really small in the grade. Questions, comments, or concerns? No? You guys still awake? Yeah. That was after lunch. Um, so let me, let, me, let, me, let me stop the video so I don't bore the people 
out there.